In the year 2000, in London, there became a striking new feat of engineering called the Millennium Bridge. Unfortunately, immediately after its opening, as you can see, the bridge swayed back and forth noticeably, and it was all due to the tiny force of patrons' footsteps. The motion of the bridge became severe, and after only two days of this swaying, engineers had to close the wobbly bridge. It did not reopen until two years later. Now these probably highly embarrassed engineers had a really big problem to solve. So what we're gonna look at today is what was wrong with this bridge and why didn't engineers foresee this problem? The answer all lies in studying simple harmonic motion. We see repeated motion more often in our life than we think about it. An example could be an acrobat swinging on a trapeze, the pendulum of a grandfather clock or a metronome. You could look at a child swinging on a playground swing, Spider-Man swinging through the city, and even... I came in like a wrecking ball. Yes, even a wrecking ball. Now before we had Miley Cyrus, simple harmonic motion was always described in terms of an object attached to a spring lying on a table. When you stretched it and let it go, it would go back and forth forever, assuming we're talking about a frictionless surface. This back and forth motion is what we call simple harmonic motion. So this describes any periodic motion, something that's repeated, as a result of two new things that we're going to talk about today. A restoring force that is proportional to displacement. So let's start talking about this restoring force. That's the force that's pulling the mass towards its original equilibrium position. So this force is always directed towards equilibrium wherever the block started and it goes in the opposite direction of wherever the motion of the object is. Now since simple harmonic motion is always involving this restoring force, this must mean that every single simple harmonic motion has a requirement of it going back and forth in the same exact path. Now in real life we obviously know that if we release a block on a spring and let it go, it will eventually slow down due to friction. We call this reality experience damping because we actually lose energy to the universe because of friction. Pretty much as you're used to it in this class, we're going to assume that it's a vacuum and that there is no friction. So we call this vibrating mass system simple harmonic motion. Now there's a few things, a few principles of physics that were forces that are acting on the mass. There is the force of the spring, the elastic force, and that force is always opposite to the direction of the mass's displacement, which we're going to use the letter X to describe. Now all of these relationships were determined by Robert Hooke in 1678, a long time ago. And the main points, and we call this Hooke's Law, kind of the big picture of what we're talking today is that he said, okay, we have equilibrium. Wherever our block started out with, there is no potential energy. Then right at this point, the spring force and the mass's acceleration, they're at zero whenever you're at that dotted line of equilibrium. And it's when the speed is at its maximum. When you're at your maximum displacement, X away from equilibrium, a far away from it it'll go, the spring force and the mass's acceleration reach its maximum. Now this should be pulling up memories for you in a past life in this physics class because this has a lot to do with work and energy. So here's a little bit of review of what that looks like. 
As the ball compresses and stretches the spring, both kinetic energy and potential energy come into play. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion, and as the ball moves, there are two points, the turning points, where it's not moving. One point is where the spring is compressed all the way, and the other is where it's stretched all the way. And the distance between either of these two points and the equilibrium point is called the amplitude. At those two turning points, the ball won't have any kinetic energy since it isn't moving. Now let's look at the actual mathematic relationships involved with measurements for spring force, restoring force, that's all directly proportional to the displacement of a mass. And what we're talking about here is called Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law states that the spring force, or the force of the elastic spring, is equivalent to a negative spring constant times the displacement that that spring is moving which is x. Now, some reminders of some units, that negative is indicating that the spring force is always going in the opposite direction of the motion. x is measured in meters. That quantity of k, the spring constant, is something that we've used in class before. And it's measured in newtons per meters, just like you saw on our energy test. The larger a K that you see means that you're looking at a stiffer spring, and you're looking specifically at what's the determined elasticity of that spring. Now, we learned this when we studied energy, but a little bit as a review. If you were to pull back an arrow, and a bow and arrow, or which is kind of acting like a spring, you would have a maximum displacement from your equilibrium point that you started out with. Therefore, you would have elastic potential energy. Once your mass, or in this case, if you're talking about an arrow, it's reached the equilibrium point and it's come back to its original position, all of the energy is transformed into kinetic energy, meaning it will be able to reach its maximum velocity at that point. Now let's actually look at one of these springs in motion. <laughs> when the mass is at rest, the spring will be at the equilibrium or rest position. Let's add a dotted line there to indicate that this is the equilibrium position. Now let's pull the mass to the right and hold it there. We can call this position one. A niche. When the mass is at position one, what is the direction of the spring force acting on the mass? At position number one, x, the displacement from equilibrium position is to the right. Therefore, according to Hooke's law, the spring force acting on the mass will be in the opposite direction, or to the left. Correct. Now we can let go of the mass and watch as the mass is accelerated to the left by the force of the spring. Notice the mass passes through rest position and will go all the way over to the left. And let's pause it there for a moment. Let's call position two the location of the mass when it is at equilibrium position and position three, the location of the mass when it is at its maximum displacement from equilibrium position to the left. Olivia, what is the direction of the spring force on the mass when the mass is at position two? That question does not make any sense because the displacement from equilibrium position at number two is zero. Therefore, according to Hooke's law, the force of the spring is also zero and has no direction. That is correct, Olivia, thank you. Kevin, what about the direction of the force of the spring when it is at position 3? At position number 3, the displacement of the mass from the rest position is to the left, therefore the force of the spring is to the right. That is also correct. Thank you, Kevin. Let's go back to the beginning of this demonstration for a moment and watch what happens. The mass is released at position 1, then it slides through position 2, pauses at position 3 before going back the other direction, and notice what happens the mass will continue to oscillate back and forth going through these positions in this order. One, two, three, two, one, two, three, two, one, two, three, two, one, two, three, two, one, two, three. And, and Kevin, in the absence of friction, when will the pattern of this mass spring system end? If there's no friction, it will never end. Correct. This is called simple harmonic motion. Now this mass spring system is in simple harmonic motion. It's going to continue to oscillate forever in the absence of friction. Now there's two requirements for this force that causes simple harmonic motion. 
One, there must be a restoring force, which is a force that is always directed towards the equilibrium position. And two, it must be proportional to the displacement, which means the magnitude of that restoring force is proportional to the displacement from that equilibrium position. So when we get our Hooke's Law equation, we see that it is a direct relationship. As x is increasing, the magnitude of the spring force will also increase. Let's look at how Hooke's Law is used mathematically. The sample problem comes from page 370 in your textbook. So the problem says, if a mass of 0.55 kilograms is attached to a vertical spring and it stretches the spring two centimeters from its original equilibrium position, what is the spring constant? Well, we're used to this. The first thing that in our four-step process that we need to do is look for our givens. We have a mass, we have a displacement, now we have to pay special attention to the units. Our displacement is currently in centimeters and it needs to be in meters. Now we also have to have a frame of reference and we're going to say that since the displacement is down below where we've set equilibrium, the displacement's actually going to be in the negative direction. Now any sort of acceleration acting on the object is only acceleration due to gravity, so we can use our 9.81 meters per second squared, and what we're looking for is the spring constant. We're going to start to create diagrams to describe what the motion is happening during the spring. These are force diagrams. If you need any reference on how to do these, think back to your notes on our force diagram unit. We know that there is an elastic force that's going to be pulling the ball upwards, and we also know there's going to be a force due to gravity pulling the ball downwards. Now, we have to choose a situation for our equation. When the mass is attached to the spring, the equilibrium position is changing. So originally, the equilibrium position is when the spring is at rest, at the dotted line. But now there's a new equilibrium position where the weight and the mass of the ball has brought the spring down. And the net force acting on the mass is now zero. Well, for the spring force that's given by Hooke's Law, it has to be equal and opposite to the weight of the mass. So we're able to determine that the, our net force equals zero, which is equivalent to our elastic force, plus the force due to gravity. This just comes from our diagram. The net force of both of our arrows we know must be equal to zero because it's at equilibrium, so we know that both of these things must be the same. Therefore, we can determine that our force elastic is the same as our gravitational force. Our gravitational force is going to be equal to the mass of our object times gravity which is pulling it down. So we can determine then if we rearrange our equation for everything to be equal to zero, that our spring constant, k, must be equal to the negative of our mass times gravity, or the force of the elastic spring, divided by the displacement. Once we plug in that information into our calculators, we're able to solve for our spring constant k to be 270 newtons per meter. Now have you seen the periodic motion of a mass spring system is one example of simple harmonic motion. Now consider these trapeze acrobats. Like the vibrating mass spring system, the swinging motion of the trapeze acrobat is a periodic vibration. Is a trapeze acrobat's motion an example of simple harmonic motion? To answer this question, we're going to have to use a simple pendulum as a model of the acrobat's motion, which is a physical pendulum. So Huygens wanted to look at a pendulum to measure time. Let's analyze what's going on exactly with a pendulum. Well, a pendulum is just a mass on a rod. And when we pull it back like we have here, away from the equilibrium position, which I've drawn in uh, dotted lines, well, it's going to swing back and forth. And if there's no friction or air resistance, it'll just do that forever. Well, we expect this pendulum to give us simple harmonic motion which means we expect that when we work out the forces and the acceleration, we want to get some acceleration that looks like minus something times x. So let's look at the forces and see if we can get that. 
because we want to understand what's going on here. Well, let's imagine pulling our pendulum back by some angle theta. Well, of course, our pendulum has some mass. And I said simple pendulum, so what that means, I should explain, is that all of the mass is in the bob at the end, which is just some really tiny little point mass at the end, and there's no mass in the rod, and everything is going to spin or swing without friction. The pendulum has mass, or weight, pointing down, and, well, there's only one other force. That's the force of tension supplied by the uh, string or rod. Well, I know that when I release this pendulum, if I've pulled it back here and I release it, it's going to swing this way down back towards uh, the equilibrium. So actually what we want to do is break this mg into a component this way that will balance the tension and a component in this direction. This picture is starting to get a little cluttered, so let me pull it off to the side and make it a little bigger. Well, I can see that this angle is the same as this angle was over here. And if that's the case, well, I can do my trig. This is a right triangle with a hypotenuse. Uh, and there's this side, which is mg cosine theta. This side's pretty uninteresting because I know it's going to exactly balance tension. How do I know that? Well, because the mass never accelerates towards the pivot point or away, it only accelerates perpendicular, directly back towards the equilibrium point. And that force that's doing this acceleration is mg times the sine of theta. Okay, so this is the force, actually I should say, that it's negative. Because, well, if I pull it back to the left, I would normally call that a negative angle. And the force is to the right, so this negative sign is actually important. Okay, so we have this force doing our acceleration, minus mg sine theta. Let's use our good old friend F equals MA. Well, in this case, minus mg sine theta equals MA. Oh, and check it out, the m's cancel. And we're left with this, that the acceleration is equal to minus g times the sine of theta. All right, let's regroup on what we just saw. So now we're looking at a simple pendulum, and you've learned this new word, which that the mass that's on the end of the pendulum is called a bob, and it's really anything that's attached to a fixed string. Now, any displacement from equilibrium, where your bob is hanging down without any force acting on it, the weight of the bob can be resolved into two components. Now, I've folded weight to remind you that weight is different from mass. Weight is a force that is measured in newtons. So weight, is, in this case, is equivalent to the force due to gravity that's pulling down on the bob. Now we're talking about two components here and we're involving our trigonomic functions. The x component of weight, which is going to be your force of gravity in the x direction, or fg sine theta, it's the only force acting on the bob that's actually moving in the direction of motion, which means that the x component is equivalent to the restoring force, that pulling force that's pushing the mass back and forth from its equilibrium position. It is zero at equilibrium when the string is straight down because at that point the angle is zero. It's the momentum in a frictionless situation that keeps the bob swinging through the point of the zero force back and forth. So we have to be able to define a coordinate system when we're looking at a pendulum. You're always going to define your force of gravity in the x direction as the direction of the motion of the bob where the force of gravity in the y direction is always perpendicular to motion the direction of the motion or also perpendicular to the force of tension that's pulling the string on the bob. So we know the x component is the restoring force and the magnitude of that restoring force must be proportional to sine theta. Now this is where it gets a little bit of tricky, but what this is telling you is that we're really only looking at small angles. We have a maximum angle of displacement that's relatively small, less than 15 degrees. The restoring force is nearly proportional to the displacement, and the pendulum's motion is an excellent approximation of harmonic motion. So what we're going to be doing is assuming that there are small angles of displacement so that we can use this for an example of simple harmonic motion. So let's draw a parallel between the spring and the box and a pendulum. Both, when pulled away from equilibrium, experience a maximum displacement on either side, either the right or the left. Due to that maximum displacement, we're experiencing different levels of acceleration, velocity, and force.
So take a second, study this diagram. It puts a really good summary onto what we've talked about thus far. To look into a simple pendulum, we have to explore three new principles, amplitude, period, and frequency. In simple harmonic motion, the maximum displacement of an object from equilibrium is defined as the amplitude of the vibration. For a pendulum, we can see this measurement by looking at the angle between where the bob is at the pendulum's equilibrium position and its maximum displacement. For our example of a mass spring system, the amplitude is the maximum amount the spring is stretched or either compressed from its equilibrium position. When we're looking at the standard units of amplitude, we're looking at either using the radian or more simply, the meter. A period, which we represent with the letter capital T, is the time that it takes for a complete cycle to occur. Our standard unit for a period is going to be the second. And frequency is the number of cycles or vibrations per every unit of time. And our standard unit for frequency is the hertz. Period and frequency are inversely related by these two principles. As you increase frequency, you're going to decrease a period, or as you increase a period, you're going to decrease your frequency. So to go over those three things, if you're looking at a pendulum, you have the amplitude, that maximum displacement from equilibrium, your period, the time it takes for it to complete a full cycle. So this example, one swinging back and forth. And your frequency is the number of cycles per a unit of time, measured in a hertz. Now let's look more closely at what a period of a simple pendulum looks like. It specifically depends on the length of the string that the bob is on and free fall acceleration. We describe this relationship by this equation our period t equals 2 times pi times the square root of the length times the free fall acceleration. Period is in seconds. The length of the pendulum string, you have acceleration due to gravity to be 9.8 meters per second squared. Pi, 3.14159. What you do not see in this relationship is that the period is not dependent on the mass of the bob or the amplitude, and this is because we're only using small angles less than 15 degrees. A period in a mass spring system is going to be dependent on the mass and on the spring constant. So we see this relationship. Our period in seconds is equal to 2 pi times the square root of the mass of the bob in kilograms divided by the spring constant in newtons per meters. Pi again is 3.14159. Again, the period does not depend on the amplitude. And this equation only applies for systems in which the spring is specifically obeying Hooke's law. So now let's look at a little bit of an experiment that I wish I could do in class for you of how these things actually function in real life. Oscillations are happening all around us, all the time. In fact, even the atoms that make up you and me are oscillating right now. Simple harmonic motion is a special type of oscillation where the amplitude is proportional to and the direction is opposite to the displacement from equilibrium position. Let's have a look at some common examples. Here, I have a simple pendulum. It consists of a string and a mass. Whilst in equilibrium position, we can measure the length. In simple harmonic motion, the quantity of interest is period, the time for one oscillation. The period is given by 2 times pi times the square root of length divided by gravity. In our case, we expect the period to be 1.55 seconds. If we displace the mass by a small distance, we initiate the simple harmonic motion behaviour. 
and then we can determine the period. After allowing for some time for the pendulum to stabilize, we can start timing. For accuracy, I'm going to time 10 full swings. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. This is the time for 10 oscillations. For one period, we need to divide it by 10. We'll also repeat this two more times for accuracy. From the equation of period, we can see that it's related to the square root of the length. This means that if we quarter the length, the period halves. And we see that this is the case. Notice that the period is not dependent on the mass. So adding more weight shouldn't make a difference. The inverse of period is frequency or the number of oscillations per unit time. In our original case, we measured 0.63 oscillations per second, or hertz. Now, let's do it again with a simple spring. Here, we have a spring and a mass. The period is given by 2 times pi times the square root of mass divided by the spring constant. That's a measure of how stiff the spring is. Again, I'll displace the mass by a small distance and let it stabilize before I start timing. I'll repeat that again two more times for more accuracy. This means we get a frequency of 1.7 hertz. To get the spring constant, we need to rearrange for k. Unlike the pendulum, we could quadruple the length, but that wouldn't change the period. However, if we quadruple the mass, the period would double. In everyday life, simple harmonic motion is all around us. Everything from wind turbines to car suspensions and even electric motors. In review today, we've gone over simple harmonic motion, Hooke's law, and what a period looks like for a simple pendulum and a mass spring system. Now we can better understand what happened to the bridge in London in 2000. The bridge wobble was a result of oscillations. The engineers did not into take into account the horizontal swaying as a result of simple harmonic motion. And this is why it took two years for engineers, because they had to counteract people's leaning into the sway of the bridge and causing that oscillation. And that concludes our learning for today. So please use the next time to utilize practice problems and don't hesitate to contact me with any questions. Thanks guys, happy learning!